right. Well, so thankful for the praise team leading us in worship the way that they do. Glory to God for how he works through them. I'm so thankful this podium finds its way up here without me knowing it every week uh, with legs of its own that no one else knows where how it gets here. Or maybe some do. The one that gets it up here knows. Cindy, was it you? It was you, wasn't it? I can see it all over you. It was Zeb. Oh, sneaky. Okay, now he's all the way in the back that fast. Okay, thank you, Zeb, for doing that. I appreciate it. So uh, this morning, great to be with you. Great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, we are going to cover an entire book today, kind of. Not really. Don't panic. Don't leave, please. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to, we're going to be in Job 42. We're going to go to the very end of the book of Job. And we're going we're gonna to pick up right there with Job and look at Job at the end of quite an experience that Job has in his life uh, that probably many of us will not experience in just the same same way that Job does, but this morning uh, we're going to look at, at Job. Uh, but you know, I in, in thinking about Job, God has been, we covered, we talked about it on our Monday night Bible study at our house. We talked a, a little bit out of the book of Job, and, and so God has just laid Job on my heart and, and uh, for us this morning, and it's so incredible. It's it, There's so much in there that it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where to go, uh, but God is, God is always faithful. But to try to illustrate, you know, um, part of this message today, I want to I want to share with you um, something that some of the men in the young adults group have decided to do, and that is uh, we have set a goal for ourselves this coming year to run a half marathon. Some of you may say, uh, why would you do that? And uh, that's a good question. I think it's a valid question. Uh, I'm most excited about Sam running with us. He hasn't been convicted of that yet, and Trey, but I know it's coming, right? The conviction, no? He's still praying about it. But nonetheless, uh, we, have, uh, we have decided to do that. Some of us, not all of us, clearly, uh, have decided to do that. And so uh, we have been working kind of towards that goal. And yesterday, uh, or, or some of us have, and yesterday I, uh, I was blessed to, to run one one of the, the longest uh, uh, runs that I've done in some time, and I didn't run it alone. I ran it with this young man right here. Uh, in the jacket that's sitting next to David Padilla. Yeah, this. Uh, yeah, he's being bashful now. But I ran it with that young man. And, and one of the places, Greg Ewing, I don't think he's here, but he works at Miami Whitewater. It's a beautiful path there, a bike path that's about seven miles long or so. And, and so I, I was blessed to run. I didn't make it seven miles, okay? So don't be too impressed. I only made it six, and it was a struggle to get the six, okay? But nonetheless, Braylon rode his bike, and I ran, and that's how we kind of go on that run. But one of the things that I found myself doing in the midst of the run is I always want to go faster at the beginning when I have energy to my own detriment at the end, right? Because I have to watch, I have this watch here that keeps track of my pace and I know myself, like I know I have this competitive spirit about me and I want to go fast, 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 but when I start off too fast, what happens at the end? You don't make it, yeah, yeah. For me, I, I don't make it, all right? That's what happens. I start walking and my kids are like, you got this, come on, come on. I'm like, no, I really don't. You don't understand, I'm dying. Uh, but no, no, I, I don't make it to the end. And Richie knows what this is about. Richie's a runner as well. He probably ran many miles this week, yes? No, okay, all right, he did not. All right, so maybe we can get him in on that half marathon thing that we're gonna do next year. We'll see. He might have to pray about it too, but we'll, we'll work on that, yeah. But, but nonetheless, I, so I'm watching my, my watch yesterday and I'm talking to Braylon and I say, as he's riding his bike alongside of me, I said, I have to control my pace. I know it's slow, but if I don't slow it down at the beginning, then I won't finish well at the end. And so I'm watching my pace the whole time and trying to, I'm, I'm literally, it's easier, it's, it's all that's in me to go faster, 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 and I'm trying to reel it back the whole time, because didn't I, Braylon, you don't have to be bashful, didn't I? I said, I keep wanting to go fast and I got to slow it down, didn't I say that? He's saying it with his eyes, even though he's being bashful, Okay. But this is the thing, is that so much of, of society is kind of that way, where it, it, 
it makes us feel like that in the early stages, we have to go fast. We have to go fast. When we are younger and working and, and, and we have to be busy, we have to be busy. And if we don't do that, then we're not productive. And, and it, it, there's a drive there just to, just to go too fast too often at the early stages to the point that by the time it's getting closer to the finish, we're not able to have the strength to finish well because we've burnt out in the beginning. Does that make sense? And so, so in the run, the only way I'm able to make the distance and make the distance well is if the beginning stages is paced. And, and for you and I in our spiritual marathon that we run with Christ, the only way that we're going to be able to make the distance is if we're willing to pull it back and just be with him, not get ahead of what he's asking us, commanding us, leading us to do, but be willing to say, I'm going to wait until you move and I'm going to go at your pace, Lord, not at mine. Because so often it seems like we end up going at our own pace and we get ahead of where Christ wants us to be. And when we get ahead of where Jesus has for us to be, what ends up happening is we get, we find ourselves in places of being burnt out. We find ourselves in being in places where we're overburdened, where we're wore out. And when it gets to the end of it all, we just say we're done. We just can't handle it anymore. And so just just like in the, the run of that we had yesterday, in the race of life, in our marathon for Christ, we have to be willing to pull it back when Christ says to pull it back. We have to understand that just because he says to wait doesn't mean that you're wrong for resting at his feet. It doesn't mean that. So Job, in this, in this whole grand scheme of things, what we find in Job is this. Some of the times, you know, one of the, one of the areas in the race that I find myself running fastest is the hills. And you may say, well, that's weird. Well, here's my thought process with that. The quicker I get them over with, the quicker they're done, right? And so stride it out, run fast, get to the top. So on the other side, when you go downhill, you can breeze downhill, you can catch your breath, and it's a little bit of a gravity situation, ease, that you can just let gravity pull you. Uh, and, and a lot of times in our life, whenever we want it to go the fastest, it's when life is the most challenging. Right? When the, when the storms come, when the difficulties come, we don't want to remain in the storm. We want to get through it, get past it, and be looking back at the storm that's in our life, don't we? And so when we get to the storm, we may be good with God and we may be just living with him and worshiping and dwelling. And then that difficulty comes and we're like, Lord, please help us to get through. Please help us to overcome. Please help it to go faster. And we just can't wait for the other side. Because that's the unpleasant moments that we have in life is when the storms come. But if you know anything about the story of Job, you know this, that Job spent significant time in the storm. And in Job's storm, it was not God's intention to get him through the storm fast, but he was going to teach him some valuable lessons while he was there. And sometimes that's where we need to be also. Even though we don't understand, we need to see and understand who remains when all else is stripped away. And so this morning, we're going to look at, we're going to begin to look at Job 42, because Job 42 is at the end of it all, and, and the very last chapter in all that God has revealed to, uh, to Job, and, uh, and, and when we get to this place, we know, if you've ever read the book of Job, you know Job's been, some thing, been through some things at this point, uh, and, then, and kind of the, the, I, the question, the thought is, when all is stripped away, what remains in your life? Where do you stand? when all else is stripped away. So if we can stand and honor the reading of God's word, let's read uh, Job 42, verses one through six together today. And we're just gonna look at what we see in Job when it's all said and done. Job 42, one through six says this, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou uh, canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered 
heard that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Hear, I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare un thou unto me. I have heard of thee, this is very important, by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you this morning. Father, grateful for the power of your word, grateful for the presence of your spirit, grateful just for the privilege to know you more. God, the only way we know you more is because you reveal yourself through uh, to us and, and you reveal yourself through your word. And Father, we just praise you for that. And I just pray, God, as we get into this today, that you will help us to see everything that you want us to see. This is not, this is not ours, this is yours. And Father, we are so grateful that you share it with us. And, and Father, we just pray for open hearts and minds to hear and to see. Father, we pray to see who you are this morning. And we love you, and we praise you for the time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you all can be seated. All right, so here, a uh, very important part here before we move too far beyond this is, is, is verse number five. So now we see Job getting to the end of the book and, 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 and it's also interesting to know that Job is one of the first books written, thought to be written in the scripture. So it's a, a very early on writing. So it's kind of a precedence that's set early on in the word of God. And, and what we find here is that now Job's tone, his whole demeanor is beginning to change and and verse 5 gives us an indication as to why. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. So, so here's an indication why. We talked about this for a few weeks when all is stripped away. Who do you see? Now it's one thing most of us, a lot of us have heard about Jesus often, have heard about God often in our life, but the difference comes when you see him for yourself. So Job said, as long as I was, I was hearing, I was hearing, I was hearing, but in the midst of hearing, Job was struggling, but then when Job saw God, everything changed. Everything began to be transformed when he saw him, and it's the same way with our salvation and our relationship in Jesus Christ. When we see him, everything looks different. And also, just like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, when he saw him, in verse 6, what does it say Job does? He repents. Right? He repents. Why? Because when you see him and you really truly see who he is, you see yourself in a different light as well. So as at the end of the book, Job says, now I have seen you. And I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Uh, so as we talk about the life of Job and the book of Job, there's a couple things I just want to bring to light. There's a few things that Job reveals where, that we see from the book of Job. One of those things is that the enemy is real and the enemy attacks, doesn't he? We see that without question, that the enemy is there. And throughout the book of Job, early on especially, we see the enemy show up and the enemy attacks. And notice that the enemy attacks Job, who is a faithful man to God. So for you and I, if we are not living for the Lord, if we are not doing what God has called us to do, the enemy is maybe not going to attack you as much because you're not a threat. But when you start living for Jesus loud and boldly and confidently, you got to know there is an enemy and the enemy attacks. We see that from the, from the book of Job. The second thing that we see is that life is uncertain, isn't it? Life is uncertain. There's no guarantees in life. Even the friends, our family, our possessions, our stuff, everything is uncertain except for one. All else is uncertain. Job probably never had it on his calendar that he was going to experience such destruction on this time and on this day. Life is uncertain. And I think everybody in this room probably can say and identify with the fact that that absolutely is the case. And there's the third thing is this. There is only one we can truly rely on. Because when the uncertainty of life hits and all else is stripped away, 
there is always one that remains. But what we have to be careful of is that everything else in life doesn't become an idol that we're not aware of intertwined in our devotion to God. You see, sometimes there's a lot of things that we can experience in life that become idols to us. Our stuff, uh, you know, our, ba- our homes, our, our bank account, our, our, uh, our comfortable lifestyles, all those things. We may not even realize it's happening, but a lot of times we don't really realize where we stand or what we're going to do until all else is stripped away, do we? Like, we don't know truly how, how would we react if we insert ourselves into the story of Job, and the reality is this, is that the reaction needs to be. We need to see God and everything else needs to fall by the wayside. We need to set our eyes on Jesus Christ as the Savior and all else can then fall away and we still stay focused and surrendered to him. But the key is what do we really rely most on in our life? Where is our true allegiance? So let's look at the things that fall away from Job. Go back to Job chapter 2, and we'll begin to see what is stripped away. Job chapter 2. Now, they, the, the stripping away comes in phases in Job's life. And it's very interesting. The entirety of the book, we see that there's a small portion that tells us what he loses, and then the rest of it is going to tell us the dialogue between him and his glorious friends, right? Um, and so, uh, l- lost from all angles, we find in Job. So at the very beginning of the, of the account in Job chapter one, we know that the beginning of the loss, it starts with really his, his possessions and his children, right? They, he begins by losing his house, his livestock, his children, and all these, there's one that escapes to come back to tell him. So all of that stuff begins to, to be stripped away. And then the enemy comes before God again and says, God, he's still being obedient because you haven't touched his body. You see, you touch his body, you inflict his body, and then he will be disobedient to you. He will reject you. So God says, okay, you can, t- you can do what you want, just don't take his life. And in Job chapter 2, verse number 9, we know that as, as the enemy comes at Job's body, that he's inflicted with boils and, uh, and he's miserable. It says in verse number 7, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown, and he took him a posture to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes." So, so everything and even his physical health is stripped away. Now, now, now here's the thing is that it's one thing, even in my life, to worship God and to serve him as long as everything in life is going pretty good. But the question is, what does our obedience to God look like when everything else in life is falling away? What does it look like when everything else is gone? Because here's the thing. We know that life isn't uncertain. And one day, that loved one, that person may be there. And then another day, that person may not be there. One day, our possessions and stuff may be there. But then the next day, it could be gone just like that. We don't know what life is going to look like. But there is always one that remains. In verse number nine, look, everything has crashed and fallen around him. Everything has been stripped away, lost from all angles. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Not the best advice in this moment in Job's life, yes? Curse God and die. Carry on. But he said unto her, Thou, thou speakest as one of the, the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Um, and so everything has fallen. His wife shows up, says, Curse God and die. Why are you still being a person of integrity? He said, Listen, we got to trust God in it all. And he did not curse, he did not sin with his lips. And then his three friends show up. 
And at first, his three friends give you actually a good impression. And, and we've talked, I talked about this with a group this week as well. In verse number 11, now when Job's three friends heard of all that this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place. Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and night, seven nights and none spake a word unto him for they saw that his grief was very great. Now, now the question becomes this. I know his friends get a bad name, but how many of us have ever went to a friend in their time of mourning and sat there in silence to be present with them for seven days and seven nights? I mean, they do get a bad name. We know that once they began to dialogue, the dialogue was very challenging and really caused affliction to come on Job. But I'll say this, for his friends, when they knew that he was mourning, they showed up. That's a big part of it, isn't it? Bear one another's burdens, be there for one another, love one another. What an expression of love to see somebody show up and sit for seven days and seven nights and not say a word. Those of us who are chatty, that would be really challenging, right? And by the end of it, Job was probably like, I wish you would have been quiet the whole time, right? But seven days and seven nights, and then it, it brings about all kinds of thoughts in my mind. Okay, so they were willing to just be there and, and just wait and be present. And then I thought to myself, how often do we even do that with God? How often are we willing to sit there and just be with God and not feel like we have to say a word, but just listen to what God would say to us? Just show up for him like he showed up for us and just be present and wait for whatever God would share. Everything about his friend showing up for seven days and seven nights and saying nothing goes counterculture to everything we know in our culture today, doesn't it? Who has seven days to go and just sit some, with someone? Who has time to just go and sit someone for four or five hours? But his friends show up. So even though his stuff was gone, his wife maybe gave a little bit of a harsh word, here comes his friends. They have not been taken away. They have not abandoned him. There are some that still remain. And so we look at this and we say, okay, so they showed up. So Job is not without anybody. There's still someone there. However, when his friends begin to talk, it doesn't go well. Um, even though his possessions were stripped, he still had his friends, but here's the thing, is that even though everybody wants to offer advice, sometimes the advice is not God's word. And it's not God's advice. And God's gonna get on to Job's friends. Because even though what they were saying, here's, here's a beautiful picture, even though what they were saying, it wasn't that it was wrong, it wasn't the fact that, you know, they assumed that Job had lived in sin and lived disobediently and that's why all this stuff was coming upon him and so they spoke that truth thinking that they were right, but in the end they were not. And so even in the midst of, of our life where we may have friends around us, this is what we find out, is that even though we like to listen to our friend's advice, there's one that we need to listen to above everyone else. Even if people come and give you advice, you need to hear it from the Lord. Because with the best intent at heart, we can still give people wrong advice. And, and Job's friends show up and the rest of the book literally almost is this dialogue between him and his friends. And his friends are condemning Job, are, are showing up and saying all the wrong things. He is already broken and Job is crying out to God and saying, God, why did you not just kill me? Why don't you just take my life? Why was I even born? I wish that, that you would have not even allowed me to come out of the womb. Job is grieving. He is wanting it to be over so bad that he says, I'm ready to die just to get it over with. And then his friends show up and they, they start giving all this kind of bad advice and they say, well, Job, you must have done something wrong. And, and the whole book is this dialogue between Job and his friends. 
And in chapter 19 of Job, what we find is that not only is his stuff taken away, but we see that for Job it hits a little bit harder than even that because also his the people around him as he sees it have abandoned him as well. Uh, and we see that Job brings this to light in Job 19 Verse number 14, he says this, Job 19, 14, my kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in my house and my maids count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I called my servant and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated her for the children's sake of my own body. Yea, young children despise me. I arose and they spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me and they whom I loved are turned against me. My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. So now we see, secondly, we see this. The abandonment continues, not just, he doesn't just lose his stuff, but he also loses family, friends, they have all turned on him. So literally, I look at the story of Job and I see a picture of a man that is, is struggling with a physical impairment, a physical struggle in his body, a man that stands there and has lost everything, a man that is struggling in, to a depth that we can't even understand, and the struggle doesn't just end because he cries out to God and says, God, I want this to be over. Will you just take my life? I don't understand why this is going on because God doesn't answer to our demands he's the king and we are the servants and so even though Job is greatly struggling God doesn't say okay I'm just going to end it so here's a question for us are you okay if God doesn't end it but allows the storm to remain how long will you be okay with God if the storm continues in your life you know, because so many times we endure things and, and, and sometimes those things are for a moment, but sometimes those things can stretch over years and years and years. And what happens over the years is because without even realizing it, our life has become entangled in so many other things and stuff. And we don't even realize that those are the things that we've relied on in life. So when those things are stripped away and we can't do the stuff we used to be able to do, we begin to panic. We begin to become depressed we begin to become broken down and we say we just don't understand why because those things in life can so easily begin to take the place of where God deserves to be and when those things are stripped away sometimes there is a tremendous sense of brokenness and hopelessness because we look at stuff rather than at him and there's only one that remains. All this has, has been taken away from Job. And then we come to chapter 38 of Job. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a real brief, all this to see what, why he says what he says in, verse, in chapter number 42. But in, in chapter 38, we see that it's this, by this point where God responds. And, and you know, up to this point, Job gets to a place in his frustration where he says, I, I, I basically, God, I, I demand that you would give Give me an answer. That's kind of what, what the way that he approaches God. I want an answer. There's just this demanding presence from Job toward God. And so God gives an answer. But here's the thing. Sometimes we may not like the answer that God gives. But we always can know that it's the right answer. And so, so Job, in chapter 38, God begins to answer. And I'm just going to read a little bit uh, of this, but in 38, 39, and 40, and 41, really the rest of the book, it's God's answer. But I, I want you to see verse, uh, chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. This is only going to take a moment for us to realize how humbling this response where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth declare if thou hast understanding 
Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud garment, therefore, in thick darkness, a swaddling band for it. In verse number 18, if we can jump on down, that hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth, declare if thou knowest it all. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof that thou shouldest, uh, shouldest take it to the bound thereof and that thou shouldest know the path to the house thereof? Knowest thou because thou wast then born or because the number of thy days is great? What, what begins to happen is that God begins to reveal to Job the greatness of who he is. From the very beginning in creation, and everything that God set in place, God begins to show Job. Job cries out to God and says, God, I don't understand this. And God says, okay, I'm going to answer you and I'm going to answer you with power and majesty and might and I'm going to say, Job, where were you when I put all these things in place? And it, was, it's a, it, it is such an incredible reminder to Job of the greatness of who God is. The foundations of the earth and all that God has done. And God begins to just unload on Job all that he has done and question Job, where were you when I did this? And, and the reality is this, is that sometimes in our storm and in our frustration, our natural tendency is to power through, to question God hard and say, God, I just don't understand. But what God does in the book of Job is he says, you don't need to understand it all but you need to be reminded of who I am in the midst of it all. He goes through the whole time of questioning and he, and, he, and he goes through the whole book and God in the power of his spirit reveals all of this dialogue with his friends, all of this struggle to find out the right answers and then God includes in the power of his spirit chapter 38 and throughout the rest of the book as to say, even when everything is stripped away, there is one that will always remain. Even when physical tragedy strikes, even when you find yourself in financial difficulties, even when life doesn't work out like you think it's going to, there is still one that remains. And, and the thing is, is that once you see this, the only proper response is to desperately grab hold of the one that remains. Because in the life of Job and the uncertainty that surrounds the life of Job, the one thing we can be assured of is that everything other than him is fleeting. He is the only one that remains. Job has lost everything. And there are people in this room right now, there are people online that have lost things. There are people probably in this room that has lost people in your life, that has lost stuff, that life, you look at life and you say, it just hasn't happened the way that I think it would. There are people that are going through really challenging situations right now that need a lot of prayer. There are people that some, that some in, here, in this room or online may be in a storm that they've been in for years and years and years and they can't see an end to it and they're so broken down and they're so, they're so beside themselves. Why does it continue? But the, the great source of hope for all of us is even in that there is one that remains God shows up to Job and he begins to unload who he is and then in chapter 40 and this is how Job at the end of it all how do we get to chapter 42 you can't get to chapter 42 until you go through chapter 40 and the first five verses of chapter 40 will tell us everything we need to know. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? How often may we be guilty of doing the exact same thing when something happens in life that we don't understand? 
Contend with the Almighty. Uh, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. So after God answers Job, here's Job's response. And, and, and we talked about this this week with some of the group. Job's response was this, right here. I've got nothing else to say. Job knew about God. Job had heard about God. Job tried to be obedient to God, but now Job had seen God. And in all of his questions and all of his suffering, and even in this moment, it doesn't, uh, you know, he's still not past everything yet, I'm certain of it. And even in all of this, after he sees God, it actually doesn't tell us that everything was restored until the very end of the book. And so in this moment, even after he has seen God and after he has experienced him in this way, the only response is that he sees himself for who he is. Like Isaiah, when he was into the presence of God and he says, I am of unclean lips and woe is me in the same way Job even in all his misery and destruction whenever he saw God he said I cover my mouth I have nothing else to say except for I am vile I am sinful you are God and Job stops all of what he was doing because he sees God for who he is. So chapter 42, this is Job's response at the end of the storm. Where we read at the very beginning, at the end of the storm, Job sees God in a different, with a different perspective. God reveals himself to Job in a way that Job has never seen before. But it's interesting to see that that does not happen um, until the storm is coming to an end. He has to enter, he's in this time of storm and that's where he sees God. So here's the thing, for you and I to see God, are we willing to go in the storm so that we can see him? Because sometimes that's where he reveals himself the most. But so often, aren't we kind of these people that we try to drive around the storm so we don't go straight through it? We try to, we try to hold back. We try to wait for it to pass. We try to find any other angles. We try to avoid it like the plague at all costs. And we say, we don't want to go through that. It looks really challenging. It looks really hard. And we don't want to, we don't want to be there. But sometimes God says, that's where I want you to be for this moment because you will see me clearer after that than you've ever seen me before. But are we willing to go in? So what you find in Job is this. A beautiful example what you find in this is a beautiful example of what we find in Christ Jesus. Because at the end of it all, who remained? Job and God. Those were the only ones that remained. Job remained in the presence of God. His friends were there. His friends gave bad advice. And as a matter of fact, uh, it says in Job chapter 42, uh, as you read on down, it says in, uh, in verse number seven, and, and it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly and that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. Even though they were ready and willing to give advice, their advice was wrong in the eyes of God. And so God dealt with them because of the wrong advice. We are so quick to listen to advice from those around us and not to take time to listen for God's word. And when we listen to others' advice, it's, it can be good advice, but it may not be God's advice. It's very important that we remember that because all the good advice in the world, that's all fine and good. All the best intentions in the world, that's all fine and good. But when you deal with God, it's not best intentions, it's good advice. It's the best advice. It's all knowing. It comes from a place of a, a king of kings and lord of lords that knows everything. So it's not a question as to whether this is what I need to do, even when it goes against what everyone else may be saying. If God says it, that's what we need to do and that's what's right for us. 
But Job is here before God, just him and God. And his only hope in this matter is the Lord. A couple weeks ago, we talked about a woman called in adultery. Do you remember that? And the woman that was called in adultery and thrown out there in front of Jesus had no other hope but, but Jesus that stood right there in front of her. Everybody else was fading away. Everyone else uh, fled as Jesus put them in their place in his own perfect and beautiful way. Everyone else departed except for him. They said, let him who has without sin cast the first stone and they began to leave from the eldest to the least. And this woman that was caught in her sin found herself in the presence of Jesus and her only hope for life was in him. Job's only hope here was God. It wasn't his friends, it wasn't his wife, it wasn't his children, it wasn't his stuff, it wasn't any of those other artificial things that you and I so often put our hope in. It was only in God. And I want to say this this morning, that our hope this morning is only in Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't have, there, there is, just like Job, just like the woman called it, whatever you want, wherever you want to look in the scripture, you and I are at the same place. Job saw God and Job said, I need to repent because I see my vileness when I'm in the presence of him. And so when we talk about salvation in our world today, sometimes people don't like to hear the word repent, but the natural progression from seeing him is understanding the sinfulness that we live in. God did not say, Job, you must repent, necessarily. Job saw himself compared to God and knew that he must repent. It's not a, it's not a matter of, of me needing to, to say the thing. The reality is, is that when we see God, when we truly see Christ and we see him clearly, we understand that the only right response is to fall on our faces in his presence and repent and surrender all to him. Because outside of him, we don't have any hope. I am greatly convicted by this passage for this reason. We put our hope in so many other things in life and we don't even realize we're doing it. I'm convinced of that. We put, our, we, we put all of our eggs in the basket of advice of family or friends. We, we, will, we will ask them, we will hear them, we will take time and we will never do, we won't just sit down and wait for God. Oftentimes. You know, even in church and in ministry, sometimes we, we, everything can become intertwined. Like what about, like sometimes people, uh, if numbers aren't there, it's like we've abandoned hope, right? Like we, something must be wrong because numbers aren't there. I mean, we do it with all kinds of little things, right? Like, like we are going to be encouraged, we're going to be fired up as long as this, 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 and this happens. And in my mind and in my heart, it's like God is reaching out and crying out of his word and he's like, why am I not enough? <laughs> Why am I not enough? Like you're, you're saying you're going to do this if all the stars align and it looks right for you. Why am I not enough? Why don't you just do it for me? Let who shows up show up. Let what happens happen. But you do it for him. So many times we, we may be convicted in our chairs and the spirit of God is speaking to us and we're like, we don't want to go forward because we're afraid someone sees, will see us or something like that. But it's like, listen, isn't he enough? It doesn't matter who sees you. What matters is that God sees you and hears you. So many times we, we know that we need to make a decision for Christ and salvation. We know that we've never really seen him. We've never been convicted. We've never been broken. We know that. We've heard about him, but you see a distinct difference in Job's story. He had heard about God, but hearing about him wasn't enough. He needed to see, he needed to see him himself. And then everything was different. We live in a world of people that claims to be Christian because they've heard about Jesus. But hearing about Jesus isn't enough. You need to, you need to meet Jesus yourself. 
We can't hide behind this. Well, I've, I've heard about him. I've grown up in church my whole life. My parents were Christians. That doesn't mean that's great, but that doesn't do anything for you. You and I need to see him ourselves. So this morning, the challenge is this, is that uh, what would, where, where would we be when all else was lost? And sometimes in America, in, in all of the blessing and all of the resources, it's hard for us to see it. But I'll tell you, I've been blessed to go to several other countries. And I have seen people that have nothing else but him. I have seen the joy and the hope and the peace and I have let the smiles on faces, the, the hospitality, the, the rejoicing, I, I have seen all that and then you go and you see where they live and you see uh, where, where their life is spent and you're like, how are you like this when you have nothing? Because they don't have nothing. They don't have material things but they have everything they need in him. Material things can cloud out our vision of Christ to the point that we don't even realize how much hope we put in that until it may one day be all gone. You know, I think that's why I've learned so much. You know, we, we had nursing home ministries back in, in Kentucky. I learned so much from those ministries because I listened to what they said when they got to that place and all else was kind of gone that they had worked their whole life for and it was just them and God that remained. And you learn a whole lot about where the true treasure is at. You spend so much time in life just running, 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 so much time in life trying to accumulate, 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 all the while Jesus is crying out of scripture saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Don't hunger and thirst for your stuff. Don't hunger and thirst for anything other than him because in him you will be truly satisfied and filled, but you won't be in anyone else. So in Job, everything is gone and one remains. And I want you to know this morning, church, the Lord wants us to know that there will always be one who remains. Everything else may pass away, but Jesus will always remain. So do you know, have you seen, back in, in chapter 42, as we go into a time of invitation this morning, here's the question. It says in verse number five, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye hath see, or seeth thee. The question is, have you seen Christ? Have you met him personally this morning? If you have, then that's amazing, but here's the question, have you seen him lately? For those that, that may have seen him and, and, and experienced him and been saved, it's not a matter of you see him once and you're internally satisfied by that. It's have you seen him lately? Have you been walking near him? Have you been able to gaze upon him and just be at his feet? But maybe you're here this morning and you've never truly seen him. It can be very confusing because we live in a culture that hears about him often, but it's not enough to hear him. You need to meet him yourself. So as we have a time of invitation this morning, here, here's the question that, that, that I want you to ask. In John 9, it also makes me think of this. If all else is stripped away, are we willing to be in the storm so that we can really see him? When all else leaves, what kind of follower of Christ are we truly? When, we, when all of our stuff, all of our comforts, all that we like to hold on to so strongly is stripped away, is he enough in your life? And you have to be honest with yourself about that. Is he enough, Christian? For that lost person, would you like to see him? Would you be willing to take a step this morning and come to Jesus, whether you're there at, at, at your seat or whether it's at the altar, and cry out to him and say, I've heard a lot about you, but I'm ready to step closer to you. Is he enough today? Let's stand this morning and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you this morning. And Lord, I, I, we praise you for who you are. 
Lord, it's so hard to get into the mindset and the picture of Job because yeah, we, we are so blessed in this country. We have so much. But Lord, thank you for the challenge from your word. Thank you for what you spoke through your servant Job. Thank you for revealing the greatness of who you are. Thank you for sharing with us that even though literally everything else may fail, you will remain. That's why you're a God above all else. That's why, Jesus, you're a Savior. Uh, you're the only Savior, you're the way, the truth, and the life because whether we have things in abundance or plenty or whether we find ourselves in a place of want, the reality is, is that our satisfaction and our all is always gonna be found in you. Lord, I pray in the power of your spirit, God, that you would convict our hearts and you would help us to see that you would reveal and uncover idols, that you would reveal and uncover things in our life that we may cling to as a hope other than you and be willing to repent and set that aside today so that we find ourselves at your feet, understanding that you are all. Lord, and I know that there are people here, even this morning, as I look across the congregation that are in kind of a stormy time, Father. Lord, that are in a time of uncertainty. And some of them, Father, it's prolonged and kept on and on and on. And Lord, I'd imagine they've had a lot of conversations with you about it. Father, I just pray for them this morning. I pray that, God, you would help them to see you clearly. Lord, that you would help them to feel your presence near them, help them to know that you haven't went anywhere. And even when we don't know, just as Job didn't understand, the one thing we can always be sure of is your faithfulness. You have never failed me and you never will. So Father, I just pray that as your spirit has freedom, we always want your spirit to move and to accomplish whatever you would have it to this morning, Lord. We pray him to this morning. We pray that you would just move in this time. God, as only you can, for your glory, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.